I described it as a as an upward forward anchor. Like when you're in a boat, you drop anchor, it goes down, it goes behind you and it disappears out of sight. But imagine that we're tethered upward and forward into the inner throne room of Almighty God. Scripture says we're seated with Christ in the heavenly realm, which means for Christians, insecurity is an illusion. We might feel insecure sometimes, but you can't be more secure than seated with Christ and tethered to God. I mean, that kind of hope, that's the long range hope that we don't grieve as people with no hope. This hope doesn't disappoint because I'm not hoping in an outcome. I'm hoping in the giver of outcomes. Have you ever felt like you're living life just bracing for a collision or that you've just been waiting for the next shoe to drop? Do you live life like that? I have often lived my life exactly in that manner, thinking that something horrible was just around the next corner of my life. Um, so many of us have developed this bad habit of, of protecting ourselves, of, of thinking critical thoughts and, and just waiting for the next storm to hit. But my guest today, Susie Larson, some of you know her, has spent the last few years cultivating an expectant heart around the goodness of God. Let me tell you, Susie seriously expects the goodness of God to invade her life. I know you're going to love our conversation no matter what your mindset is because it's always refreshing and it's always a joy to talk to Susie Larson. I'm Carol McLeod and I'm your host on the Significant Women Podcast. This is a podcast where we talk about women's stories and how the God of creation lives in them, strengthens them, and gives them all the joy they need for an ordinary day. So lean in and listen to my conversation with Susie Larson. Well, I am here with my friend Susie Larson today. Um, and it's just a delight to have you with me, Susie. What a joy. You are a fellow warrior, a fellow communicator, and uh, you bring joy everywhere you go in spite of what you're going through. So I'm going to start differently today. Usually I start with a light question. You're not going to get that. I'm going to ask you something. <laughs> okay. okay. So Susie, how in the midst of the world we're living in, in the midst of the world you're living in, how do you keep your faith so strong and vibrant? Boy, that is a wonderful question. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking you experience the same thing that when you release a book, there's backlash, yeah. there's enemy oh payback yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. And it's usually testing in the area of your message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And having released the book we're talking about today, Waking Up to the Goodness of God, I just, I got completely hit with another, you know, scary health threat and oh. um, sent me to my knees. And this is the thing I've been thinking about, Carol, that uh, uh, I have this guest on my show, Dr. Rob Reamer, um, yeah, who I comes know, on once a month. And one of mm -hmm. the things he says is the thoughts that run unfiltered through your mind are directly mm -hmm. connected to issues undealt with in your heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, think about that for just a moment. Yeah. Yeah. So when I, um, these battles that I have walked through, there are times when I see other people seeming to skate through life without right? health challenges, without the, you know, the heartbreak mm -hmm. and the hardship yeah. and loss and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I've just wondered, you know, and I always asking God, am I giving enemy access in any way? And as my friend Maria says, you search your heart. If the Lord doesn't show mm -hmm. you anything, roar. If he shows mm -hmm. you something, repent and then roar. But remember who you are, right? Wow. So when I'm searching my heart, you know, he might convict me of some little thing where I have an attitude against a politician on the TV, whatever. But most <laughs> of the time, you know, I walk in reverence before God. You know what I'm saying? I keep short yeah. accounts on things. Yeah. And what he's really shown me is that these battles have taught me hand to hand in combat. You know, these mm -hmm. battles have chased me into the arms of God. And I was thinking recently about David. And at a time when most kings went to war, he stayed back. Mm -hmm. And when you see all of these um, leaders falling, mm -hmm. it, it's so sobering. And I shudder to think of there but for the grace of God go I. What would I have done if I weren't engaged in a battle for my life, for my health, for my family? Because mm -hmm. I will just tell you that the, the, the engagement has kept me running to the arms of God. And one mm -hmm. thing Rob Reamer says is, you know, it's one thing to thank God in the battle. It's so hard to thank him for the battle. But he said yeah. when his marriage was just falling apart and God said, I want you to thank me for it here because it's forging something in you. He mm -hmm. said, as he started mm -hmm. to do that, he said, mm -hmm. out of that battle, 
his soul care conferences came. He does these soul care conferences mm -hmm. all over the mm -hmm. world that are helping thousands and thousands of people. And mm -hmm. as I started to really look at, um, instead of comparing my life to someone who seems like they have it easier, going, what has been the blessing out of the battle? What has been my takeaway? Um, I've really realized that um, just a simple devotional time in the morning isn't enough for the times we're in. So I'm on my knees a lot. I'm grabbing any kind of time I have because I feel myself under fire. I'm putting on worship music. I'm immersing myself in worship music. I march around my basement sometimes for 10 minutes at a time. I submit to God. I resist the devil. I reject a spirit of fear and intimidation, all the ways he comes against me. I yeah. think of the thoughts unfiltered in my head, connected to the issues undealt with in my heart, and I bring those to the forefront. So I feel like I'm just so engaged with God because I have to be, but now I see it's his provision. Because when you're wanting a life of comfort and ease, when you're really comparing yourself to someone who doesn't seem to be struggling, our human condition compels us to wander, to mm -hmm. dabble, to loosen mm -hmm. the grip. And I would mm -hmm. say my faith is more vibrant than ever, but I compare it to someone who's uh, working out. You know, that they're yeah. not sitting on the couch of ease, eating pizzas, binge watching Netflix. They're yeah. going to the gym four or five right. times a week. And, yeah. and in opposition, there's a vitality that's coming out of them. And so for me, I'm really in a place of thanking God in and for the battle because I see what it's doing in me. You know, earlier when David was engaged with the battle with Saul, I mean, Saul was the more skilled warrior, so to speak. He had a head up on him in his status and mm -hmm. position and mm -hmm. all of that. But scripture says in that battle, over time, Saul grew weaker and David grew stronger. Wow. While the enemy does not have an unlimited supply of endurance, he absolutely does not. I mean, he's yeah. like a lion and lions don't have endurance. So they rely on intimidation. They rely on the mm -hmm. roar. And uh, we just have to not quit. And right. I just say, instead of engaging in self-pity, which I have, I've felt mm -hmm. sorry for mm -hmm. myself plenty of times going, this is such a long battle. But now I see it differently. I see it was God's protection, and uh, I love him more than I ever have, and I feel like I'm in the eye of the storm. So that's yeah. a long answer for a short question, but um, that's how, for me, it's moving beyond a devotional diet. It really is, just yeah, because yeah. of the times we're in. It's fasting. It's praying. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just carving and trimming off the fat of my life in whatever time I can, immersing myself in worship or marching around my house, reminding my soul of the promises God has made me. And it's making me stronger. I love it, Susie. I love it. No, that's why I'm asking you these questions, um, because of the choices, the hard choices. But both are hard. You know, if you choose to to eat pizza and sit on the couch and watch Netflix, that's a hard choice because mm -hmm. you're going to eat the fruit of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask you another hard question, Susie. Um, and I rarely bring up people's names, but I'm going to right now because I love both these people. So Joel Osteen, I love Joel's message that God is a good God and he's got good things for you and your best days are ahead of you. If I were in Houston, I would go to Joel's church. I love that positive, hopeful message. Then there's my number one heroine of the faith, Elizabeth Elliot, who says, mm. suffering is never for nothing. Susie, help us out. Where do you land? What is your theology about trials and suffering? Hmm. So that's a great question. If you read the New Testament and you read Paul's words, you'd have to look the other way to say suffering isn't a part of this journey. Um, I say God doesn't write pain into our stories, but he he will redeem it. What he allows, he redeems. And mm -hmm. so I, I have to say, this is really a complicated answer, and Lord help me to answer it the best way I know how. I do think we have a passive apathy, and we put up with too much from the enemy. I do think we have a say in some of the things that we go through. We let him march into our territory, rob us blind, and we passively put up with these lingering senses of doubt and insecurity and inferiority. And at some point, some time, we've got to get our game on, get our armor on and say, enough already. You don't get yeah, to have my yeah. family. You don't get to yeah. have my identity. Jesus won that for me. Mm -hmm. And I would say you can minimize the collateral damage of a lot of your life when you stay engaged. I just think there's uh, an epidemic of apathy and passivity in the body of Christ and uh, in, my friend Maria says there's a pattern of theft in all of our lives, too, that starts from childhood and mm -hmm. that, you know, the enemy tries to condition us to believe his lies. And I think that's absolutely true. You go back to your childhood. 
the first time you didn't feel like you were enough or you felt fear. Mm -hmm. That was Mm -hmm. the enemy's preempt on you. He's Mm -hmm. trying to Mm -hmm. go after your identity and and before you know you have one, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, his threat, I always say to you, is very connected to your threat to him. Excuse Mm -hmm. my voice. Mm -hmm. So I will say, on one hand, I do think there's a lot you can stand against. Psalm 91 is a powerful passage. Um, Mm -hmm. But then you got Psalm 18, where it's a picture of being confronted in a moment you were weakest. And you can't eliminate all suffering. You can't. You can't name it, claim it your way out of a, you can't name your, claim your way into a perfect life. Mm -hmm. This is Mm -hmm. a fallen world. Jesus, out Mm -hmm. of his own mouth, said, in this world, you will have trouble, tribulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But be of good Mm -hmm. cheer. I've overcome the world. Mm -hmm. And he learned Mm -hmm. obedience through the things he suffered. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't like that so much. But I'm telling you, when you submit to God and you resist the devil, on on the playing field of suffering, you have to clear the field of all the enemy occupation because when he get, wow. he will capitalize on all that stuff. Wow. So you got to discern, you know, what is the enemy doing that I have authority to clear that field? Now, Lord, what, what does that leave me with? There are some things, you know, that happen. My friend, Dr. Lee Warren, he's a brain, sur- brain spine surgeon, neurosurgeon. I have him on my show pretty regularly and he loves God. He didn't do anything to deserve this, but he had a son that was kind of partially wandering. Not really. They just had a disagreement about going to college or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't totally remember the story, but there was a little bit of a a divide. And he was fasting and praying for him. And that son of his called and said, Dad, I was was wrong and I want to come home. I love you. And they had this reconciling, amazing conversation. And I want to say it's within a few days of that, he was murdered. And And he was stabbed multiple times. And he uh, was in a, a room and, and with a with his best friend. His friend was stabbed twice, and he was stabbed multiple times. I think, forgive me, because I don't remember if they both died yeah. or not. I think they did. But his son was stabbed like 12 times in the neck. Uh, and the police never investigated. They summarized that possibly he stabbed his friend twice and then stabbed himself 12 times. And so they just tied up the case as if they think he did. Like So they're left with this open-ended wound going, What? When truly, yeah. it's like that. These two, there was no drugs, there was no alcohol, and there were three knives. So it's like this tragedy. And he calls these things massive things. And you're going to go through massive things. So if you have a theology that says A plus B always equals C, that is not gospel. It just isn't. We got to know that we live in a world behind enemy lines. And, and if we have this mentality that it's going to always be good, and if it's not good for you, you missed a step. When we see the suffering person, we will step back in judgment. But when Jesus saw the suffering people, when he saw the masses, Scripture says he was moved with compassion. So I always say, when you come upon someone who suffered for a long time and you feel judgment, you're operating in formulas and not in mm-hmm. faith because, uh, you know, Suffering is part of this life. And even if someone is suffering because th- they brought it on themselves, is there no compassion in our hearts to help walk them through right. to the other side? Right. So I, I don't mean that to be, I think it's a both and, Carol. I really do. I, I'm a feisty enough fighter. And I will say, I'm more healed than I've ever been. Uh-huh. And I will attribute that to a, a comp- compilation of things, of fasting, of praying, of standing and fighting hard, going, these promises are mine. I have a biblical case. I, you know, I'm not moving from this place. And amazing godly doctors who have fought for me and Mm -hmm. praying friends and healing prayer ministry because of the trauma from being sick like I've been, the emotional trauma of that. I mean, it's this conglomeration of that, good supplements. I love my infrared sauna. I mean, I feel like for me, it hasn't been a once off. It's been this journey but I do feel like I had so much stuff baked in to my story that if God were to zap me and heal me, I would still have been the same insecure, fearful person. So all of that to say, everybody has their own walk of faith to walk. But I would dare you to ask God, are there places that I'm apathetic and passive and I put up with too much of the enemy that you want me to strategically stand against and reject, you know, to reject his lies and accept your truth? Because we do have to actively engage. And then for those who are suffering, the long road of suffering, I've been on the receiving end of this, and I'm sure you have too, where people are are summing up your story in a way that puts the blame on you. And what that does is distance them from your pain so that it doesn't happen to them. And they just don't understand that that massive things happen 
to really good people. There are godly parents who have prodigals. There are people who've eaten healthy and exercised and still gotten sick. And it's prideful and it's arrogant to think yes. we can control God to the point where we can have a pain-free life. I just don't think it's right. Yeah. Oh, so good, Susie. Thank you. Man, That just that was worth listening to. Thank you so much. But I do want to talk about, you know, I have a saying in life, Susie, don't waste your pain. Mm -hmm. So many people get, crawl into a fetal position. They think they can't be used because they're in the middle of pain. Um, and you are one of those extraordinary women who has refused to waste your pain or even be defined by your pain. And your new book is a testament to that very fact. I'm so excited about it. Waking up to the goodness of God, 40 days toward healing and wholeness. So tell us, tell me, Susie, some of the components of this new book that you're excited about. You know, thank you. I, you know, I've been on your show before and given yeah. backstory, so I won't go there so much. But for those who don't know, I contracted Lyme disease during my pregnancy, uh, third pregnancy over 30, 34 years ago. And it's been an up and down, hard, long battle and uh, had a pretty massive relapse about eight years ago. And apparently people with chronic Lyme um, can't process mold. And I was unknowingly repeatedly exposed to black mold that attacked my brain. So I was starting to have, uh, on top of scary neurosymptoms, cognitive issues. I was writing a book and couldn't remember how to spell very basic words. I'm on live radio every day where you have to be able to think on your feet. And I'm putting the wrong words in my sentences. My tongue is going numb. My head is going numb. Bone crushing headaches, ear ringing so loud I thought my head would explode. Um, there are nights in the middle of the night where all of a sudden my heart would start to beat out of my chest irregularly and numbing would shoot up into my neck and jaw. It would feel like a stroke and everything in my body would be going awry. And I, I would come down here because I didn't want to wake up my husband. I would pace the floor and, and quote scripture and deep breathe. And I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land yeah, of the living. Yeah. But by morning, I was so wrung out. I would say, God, you have to kill me or heal me because I can't mm, keep doing Susie. this. It was it was hard. It just was. Yeah. And um, in the middle of that place, a friend um, who had so much compassion, not an ounce of judgment in her heart, said, Susie, it seems like you're developing a posture of uh, waiting for the next shoe to drop, of bracing for impact. Mm. Wow. And there was no judgment in her mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and not any defensiveness in me. But at, just at first thought, I thought, well, that I think is the natural uh, predictable reaction to an unpredictable disease. Like when you don't know when these surges are going to hit. I, it was such a bad, hard time for me. I, I yeah. was sort of like that. But there was so much compassion in her voice that it quickened in me. I thought there's more here. Mm -hmm. So I brought it to the Lord and said, is there more? Is there? Show me my heart. And um, mm -hmm. he opened up the basement of my soul and stuffed down in that space. I was hurt by him and disappointed in him. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it. You know, I, mm -hmm. I often say that when you hear people say, I'm mad at God, I'm not talking to him right now. That's adolescent. I mean, God bless you, but that means you're a young and immature believer. You'll grow out of it, I hope, because you want to revere and honor God. It wasn't that. It was, it was almost like a wife who deeply loves her husband, but has unresolved hurts and, and deep wounds that haven't been resolved yet. So she's doing life as a married woman, but there's something that's not addressed yet. And yeah. God knew that about me more than I knew that about me. And he showed me that I was hurt. I was disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I was bracing for impact because I thought, I know you're able. I don't think you're willing to deliver mm -hmm. me from this. Oh, and um, wow. that was so painful to face. Yeah. And the Lord really just showed me how the symptoms being as crazy as they were, were taking me on a crazy path. And the thing is, you can't at once be receptive to all God wants to give you with open hands while living with elbows locked. You can't do those two mm -hmm. things at the same time. And so I said, to show me the way out. And he, um, there's, there's two passages of scripture I'm going to refer to, and I'll just give you some of the practical ways he led me to building a case for the goodness of God. I never intended okay. to write this. This was my journey towards healing. Mm -hmm. And then it just became a book. Uh, but God over and over again led me to Jeremiah 17, 7. And it says, mm -hmm. blessed are those, which means to be envied, you know, happy are those who trust in the Lord, 
who've made the Lord their hope and their confidence. They're like a tree planted by streams of living water. The roots go down into the streams of living water. They're not bothered by the heat. They don't fear the long months of drought. Their leaves stay green. They continue to bear fruit. In other words, they're flourishing in and out of season, in yes. and out of, of heat and drought yes. and places that normally would shake other mm -hmm. people. So mm -hmm. that was one thing I was hanging on to for a while. And then one day the Lord bumped me back to a verse six, this, the verse preceding it. And it says, cursed are those, this is my paraphrase, who put their hope in man and man-made solutions. So when your eyes are on anything but God, cursed are those. They are like a stunted shrub in the desert. So basically mm -hmm. you stunt your own growth when you look away from God in your circumstances. If you're looking to the next politician, you're looking to your spouse, you're looking to your boss, you're looking to yourself or any man-made system, it says, cursed are those who put their hope in man. They're like a stunted shrub in the desert. And the New King James Version is closest to the original translation in this case, and it says, and they do not see goodness when it comes. Now think oh, about wow. this. When your eyes are off God, you're not gonna see goodness when it comes. But what does yeah. God say in scripture? You see, I'm doing a new thing. Do you perceive mm -hmm. it? Which means you could miss it. And yeah. the thing is, I was missing it. He was moving all around me. He was acting on my prayers. But I was on such a wild goose chase with these wretched symptoms. I was missing it. So I said, show me how to see it. Open up my eyes again. And he started to show me. I heard a quote years ago, and it came back to me. And it was, if we woke up tomorrow with only the things we have today, mm -hmm. what would we have? And so I started to look around at what I would miss tomorrow. And the thing is, Carol, God is meticulous and miraculous. He knows what you would love, and he knows what I would love. And every good gift comes from his hand. So instead of just counting my blessings and amassing my blessings, I traced every blessing. I tethered it to a father who is good, who loves me. So I visualized to Susie from the father. I saw every gift that way with a gift tag, to Susie from the father. And something started to change internally for me because as I looked around and noticed his goodness, it was like I was building a case for the goodness of God. And I was getting to know him for who he is and not who he seemed to, to be in my hard times. And uh, there's more to it, but this book is their short readings. First, I have you pray from above your circumstances. In other okay. words, where you're declaring, God, I know you're good. I know you're mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. I've begged and pleaded in prayer, and you can pray any way you want. He says, pray all the time. But I never feel better after begging, pleading prayers. I always yeah. feel better when I pray from above. So I basically am saying, Father, I know you're good. Your promises are true. You will always make a way for me. You see yeah. me now, and you're right now moving in ways I cannot see. So I start yeah. with a short prayer like that, then a short reading, and then there's a faith declaration and a brain retrain. And I, this is okay. really, really important. The okay. faith declarations, you're not meant to like memorize all of them, but there are going to be some that stand out to you because I, I'm looking at healing in layers. One day I'm going to address body image. Another day I'm going to address bracing for impact. Another day I'm going to address our coping mechanisms and how they numb us from really mm -hmm. being consecrated and receiving all God has. And so then the faith declaration at the end of each chapter kind of corresponds with that. So one of them that I love that I use all the time when the, when the rogue thoughts of fear around my health come at me, I say, the cross has spoken. The curse is broken. Mm. Jesus has set wow. me free. And so the whole point and the dream and the desire for this book is to take you on a journey. It's a 40-day journey. I would yeah. love it if you take 60, take mm. more time, and retrain your heart and mind. We all have trauma. Everybody yeah. has things that have happened to them that mm -hmm. shouldn't have, and things that have happened that shouldn't have happened for them that didn't happen. You know what I mean? Things that they right, should have I do had, know. but they didn't have. Yeah, and right. when you don't resolve the hard parts of your story in light of God's love, mm -hmm. um, those are open loops. And those are places yeah. where the enemy can get in and build a case against God and get you to accuse him of things the devil's actually guilty of. So mm -hmm. at some point, you've got to take some time to care for your soul and resolve those hard parts of your story so that when the enemy comes in and tries to accuse God, you're like, you got the wrong man. I know my father. I have built a case for the goodness of God in my heart. Yes, yes. And I'll just wrap by saying this. My husband had said as he was watching me, he's like, I'm watching you change before my eyes. Your eyes wow. look different. Your body wow. looks different. And Carol, I could feel my cells like opening up just because my body was starting to rest in God's care. My hope and dream is that you move from bracing for impact to just wondering with holy expectancy what amazing thing God has up his sleeve for you. 
Well, we'll get back to my conversation with Susie in just a minute, but I I have an invitation for you today. I would like to invite you to become part of the Carol McLeod Ministries family. Let me tell you a little bit about it. We are a ministry on mission. Our mission is to make hell smaller and heaven bigger. Our mission is to bring the joy of his presence to the women of this generation. Our mission is to deliver the truth of scripture in a hopeful, helpful, practical way to our generation. It's why we're here. It's why we're still breathing oxygen for those reasons and actually so many more. So I hope that your faith has been strengthened by listening to this podcast. Maybe you get our weekly devotional and that has strengthened your life. Maybe you follow us on social media and you love the positivity and the hope and the joy. Maybe you've read some of our books or attended a conference. Well, the invitation is this. Would you pray about supporting this ministry? We just love rolling up our sleeves, getting involved in people's lives, and sharing with them the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, there are so many ways you can support us. You can pray for us. If you are a committed prayer warrior, shoot me an email, carol at Carol McLeod Ministries, and say, Carol, I'd love to join your team of intercessors. I am a prayer warrior. Maybe you can afford to be a monthly donor. You know, we have monthly donors that range from $5 a month to, I don't know, about $400 or $500 a month. The the amount doesn't matter. What matters is the faithfulness and the commitment to the unshakable kingdom of God. You can just go to my website, carolmcleodministries.com and click on donate. And let me just say, I love serving God with all of you. So welcome to the family. Now let's get back to my conversation with Susie Larson. So in the Bible, Susie, numbers are vital. Numbers are important. They mean something. So when I saw that your new book was 40 days, my spirit leapt because of what 40 means in the Bible. Let's talk about that for a minute. What does 40 mean in the Bible? You know, 40 days is looked at as a pilgrimage in scripture. Mm -hmm. And yet in brain science, they say it's 40 to 60 days to to form new neural pathways. So that's Mm -hmm. why I said in the intro, this is a 40 day devotional. But if you want to take 60, there are a lot of groups that are doing that and they're going a little bit slower because I want you to think about the neural pathways in your brain. They're, They're paved from your most persistent thoughts, the most consistent things that you think. And one of the things I want to see accomplished here is for you to start taking slow inventory of the story you're telling yourself. In fact, I challenge you to ask God, what's the story I'm telling myself that's killing me? What are the Mm. thoughts I think Mm. that weaken me? Because this is the thing is it literally comes in layers. He'll address one area and he'll invite you to wholeness and freedom. And then the next layer will come up and surface. And that's just how God works because it's our nature. It's what we need. We, we, we tend to heal slowly. We just need that, right? Mm -hmm. And so as you start to dare to trust him, all of a sudden you'll realize uh, you've got thoughts on repeat that you have not challenged in a long time. They might look Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. I'm so fat. I'll never get ahead. Um, I hate that mole on my nose. Or this Mm -hmm. kind of thing runs in my family. Or you think about your, your job. I'm always on the outside of the circle, outside of favor. And we say things in agreement with the enemy's plan rather than in agreement with God's promises. So I'm asking you just to take a slow inventory and renew your heart and mind to the point where you go, wait a minute, this might feel true. But if I believe God's word, this is actually true. So I'm shifting my heart and I'm forming a new story. I'm telling myself a better story about my life. Yeah. You know, in in your book, you talk about the gift of expectancy, and then you put an adjective in front of it, holy expectancy. Well, is holy expectancy the same thing as hope? Is, is that the umbrella you put it under? Let's talk about holy expectancy for a minute. Boy, that's a great question. And I don't remember if I talked to you about this on your show before, but I would say over 20 years ago, a mentor friend of mine said, Susie, you need to know the difference between expectations and expect- expectancy. She said, expectations wow. are premeditated disappointment. And oh. you know, we've got to really know the distinction here because it's extremely important. You, you're deciding ahead of time to be disappointed mm-hmm. because you're telling God the only way you're going to be happy or okay is if he hits this bullseye. 
but he's not bound by our dictates. He doesn't jump through our hoops, right? Mm -hmm. We don't Mm -hmm. dictate to God. He dictates right, to us. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. when you hear people say, I want my marriage healed by Valentine's Day, well, that's nice. But those timelines just rarely work because God's ways are higher than our ways. So expectation, premeditated disappointment. But what happens is people stop there. They'll pray. They'll hit a bullseye. I want my prodigal home by Memorial Day weekend or whatever. And God mm-hmm. doesn't deliver on their demands. And mm-hmm. they give up prayer altogether. They give up any kind of hope altogether. But mm-hmm. expectancy takes a lot of courage, but you're living with wide-eyed wonder, open-handed expectancy saying, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know my God and he will come Amen. through for me somehow. Amen. And that Amen. takes a, an, a heart hospitality before God. Where you, But you have to open up to the mystery of God because mm-hmm. if he makes you wait, it's because he's making you ready. His delays are always divine and always about a greater deliverance. He yes. cannot... He will not submit to our demands, our whining demands. It's not even good for us to get what we want when we want. Half the time, the things we're asking for aren't good for us. And he's a good father. So he's preparing us for the answer as he's providing the answer. So that holy expectancy, it's not an expectation. It's not a whiny, you know, toddler expectation. It is a grounded, godly hope in God saying, I know you're good. Yeah. Now, hope, uh, Warren Wearsby says, the kind of hope that we have in God, it's not a hope-so hope. It's a no-so hope. Uh. And so I, the distinction I would make between hope and holy expectancy, although I think they're maybe twins, you know, I think they're, uh-huh. they're closely related. Uh-huh. Scripture says this hope is an anchor for our soul, yes. leading us past the inner curtain to the inner sanctuary of Most High God. And mm-hmm. so one of my books, I described it as, a, as an upward forward anchor. Like, and you're in a boat, you drop anchor, it goes down, it goes behind you, and it disappears out of sight. But imagine that we're tethered upward and forward into the inner throne room of Almighty God. Scripture says we're seated with Christ in the heavenly realm, which means for Christians, insecurity is an illusion. We might feel insecure sometimes, but you can't be more secure than seated with Christ and tethered to God. I mean, that Mm. kind of hope, that's the long range hope that we don't grieve as people with no hope. This hope doesn't disappoint because I'm not hoping in an outcome. I'm hoping in the giver of outcomes. Yes. Yes. But I would say holy expectancy to me means that not only will I see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, but if his if he has a no for me in this life, it's because he's got a bigger yes for me in the next life. To me, I see it so much more about his meticulous, intimate involvement in my story. And uh, yeah. so that's, yeah. again, they're, they're, they overlap yeah. to me, but they are a little yeah. bit different. No, I love that. You know, Susie, years ago, I wrote a definition of the word hope, and this is what I wrote. Hope is fiercely believing that the goodness of God will intervene first in me and then in my circumstances. Mm, um, I love that. And because the goodness of God, it's not that I'm going to get my desired result, but I want His desired result. So that's what I'm hoping in is his mm-hmm. goodness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love that. You know, I, before we go, Susie, I, I do want to talk about one other thing that your book addresses, and that is um, body image. Because for women, oh, sister, you know, we know we're a masterpiece. We know we've been created in the image of God. And yet we don't like our noses. We don't like our hips. We, we wonder why she's a size two and can eat hot fudge Sundays, <laughs> yeah. and I'm a size 14 and only eat salad, you know, body image. How do you address that in your book? Hmm. This one surprised me. You know, I worked at, as a fitness professional for over 10 years. So I, I, it, it's I kind of an ironic thing for me because I, I love the human body. I love health. I, you know, I think if I wasn't in full-time ministry, I'd either be in full-time fitness or healthcare because I find it so fascinating. And I think Having been a student of suffering for 30 years, I've had to learn a lot. I've got an incredible education on just the human body, and I've got amazing, amazing doctors. So on one hand, I'm fascinated and so profoundly appreciative of God for, you know, just the thought that you walk out of a dark room into a light room and your eyes adjust. That's amazing. Mm. That, that you sweat, that your body detoxifies when you sweat. You know, I mean, there's so many things that God has made us. that are So, so I, when I get into the minutiae of that, I'm absolutely amazed. However, it was during the writing of this book, I have a little workout room right down over there and a mirror on the wall because I used to teach all these classes. So I know enough about form that you don't 
you'll drop out of form if you're not watching yourself. And, you know, you get tired or anything and you're lifting wrong, you're going to hurt yourself. So we've got a big mirror on the one wall. And so I was just doing some kind of strength training. And the Lord said, I want you to drop those weights, look in the mirror and say, I love my body. And I'm like, what? And I, I couldn't. It was like blocks in my mouth. And he said, I want you to say that. And um, I had to step back and go, okay, here's yet another place in my life that needs healing. And this is my hope for you in the book is I, I, didn't, I just didn't think about it that much. But when he brought that up, Carol, I thought, my body has betrayed me. My body mm. has let me down. My body's mm. older. <laughs> my body is so hypersensitive to toxins and environmental issues. As a speaker, I travel all over the country. I can't tell you the times. I'm begging God that the church or the hotel don't have mold in them because I have serious cognitive and neurological reactions within 10 minutes. And so it's like I've asked them, either heal me or take me off the road. But I can't stand being that person who needs accommodations Oh, I'm sorry. I have this mold. I mean, it's embarrassing to me. And so this flood, again, of disappointment and frustration came. And I'm like, oh, God, I didn't know that was down there in the soul. And so I had to stop and just say, um, the reason I love this body is it's a temple of the living yeah. God, of the Holy wow. Spirit. Wow. And Lord, I want to thank you on that basis. I want to thank yeah. you for my body. It's a vessel. Yes. And you even said in our weakness, you'll show yourself strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. strong. And that just began a healing process where then he started to show me I'm actually much stronger than I thought because there's been a narrative of having so much health challenge. I'm actually pretty fit and pretty healthy. My doctors have said, other than the neuro stuff that I deal with, that my blood work and my fit fitness level, so to speak, is higher mm -hmm. than most women my age. And I only say that to all glory of God because, mm -hmm. but I wasn't seeing that because I, I didn't want to talk about it because I had disappointment in my body, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that as you, if you could stand in front of the mirror and ask the Lord, show me my heart, he will bring your stuff up and then he'll show you what's true because that stuff's killing you. That stuff's yeah. weakening you. And yeah. the enemy wants these inroads so he can accuse you and accuse God. You know, you see, he lets you down, your body lets you down. If you live with that lingering thought unchallenged, it will weaken you. And that's how I want to see you healed. It's just one issue, one topic at a time. Yes. Bring it into the light and then receive his truth and then speak it back out so your own ears hear it. Yeah. I love it that we're tackling these topics. I, I love it, Susie. So the name of the book is Waking Up to the Goodness of God, 40 Days Toward Healing and Wholeness. And I can guarantee you, Susie, that I'm going to be loving, lavishing, splashing on the pages of this book. So thank you so much. So Susie, before you go, would you pray for my listeners? I know they would love it. Oh, I'd be so honored. Yeah. Thank you. Father, I want to thank you for Carol and her beautiful, beautiful heart and the way that she ministers uh, with such winsome joy. I pray you pour out your spirit on her in a fresh way. God, you strengthen her frame, God, yes. that you give her a love for her frame and her body um, because she's so fearfully and wonderfully made. I pray she'd live out her days in health, vitality, energy, uh, vision, boldness, courage, conviction, clarity. I pray you give her everything and then some that she could live a surprising life in you in this phase of her journey, Lord. And I pray for the friend listening today. God, I'm just getting a sense that there's some who are young who are brokenhearted and feeling full of insecurity and disappointment and mm -hmm. fear. And then you look around at the world and you wonder if there's even a future for you. And I can just say there is. There's a good, good future for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. That it's his will to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. So I pray that healing would flood your being, that you'd lift, that you'd feel Jesus lifting your chin and you'd see his face. And that the warmth of his countenance would heal your soul and make you whole and put you right where you're thinking wrong. And God, I pray for all of us, if there are lies lingering in us, left unchallenged, show us what they are so that we could step into our armor, we could uproot the lie, we could plant the truth, we could stand and reinforce the freedom that you want for us, God. We want to be actively engaged, uh, people of God. And I get the sense as I'm praying here too, that for some, you've been doing the same devotional thing you've done for years, and that's great, but you might be in a rut. 
and it's time to do a new thing. If you want God to do a new thing, you need to do a new thing. So I just pray that there be, they make more space for you, make more room. They cut out something in their lives and fill that space with a worship set, yes. time on their knees, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But I just mm-hmm. sense that as you they draw near, you're going to draw near as you promised, God. Mm-hmm. You have mm-hmm. more for them. So put a hunger and a thirst in their hearts to run hard after you. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that we would all live such redeemed, free, whole, healed lives in the middle of this chaotic world uh, that we would make the devil sorry he ever messed with us. I mm-hmm. pray this mm-hmm. in your son's precious name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Susie, thank you so much. It's mm-hmm. always just a delight to share the Lord with you. So thank I you. I feel the same. You're a dear sister, hun. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Well, if you've been encouraged by today's episode, by my conversation with Susie Larson, would you take just a minute and leave a review on whatever platform you've listened to the podcast? It might be iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or even YouTube. Would you just say how this podcast has blessed you, encouraged you, or strengthened your faith? It means more to us than you can possibly know. Also, don't forget to download our mobile app on your smartphone. Just go to the App Store, do a search for carolmccloudministries.com, and it'll pop right up. You know, actually, the app is a great way to stay in touch with the ministry, to, to read a blog, leave a prayer request, see where I'm speaking next. All of it is part of who we are and what we do. You know, one of my goals for this year, 2024, is to memorize a passage of scripture every single month. There's actually a Facebook group, Beautifully Rooted, and we're all doing it together. I think at this point there are nearly 500 of us who are memorizing scripture together in 2024. So let's look at at part of the scripture we're going to be memorizing this year. It's Psalm 91. Let's look at the first two verses. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my strength, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Sweet sister, let me tell you, you can trust God. He is worthy. He is reliable. He keeps every single promise he made. No matter what you're going through in life today, I pray that you will run to the shelter of God's word. I pray that you will run to the safe place of worship. I pray you will cover yourself in intimate prayer with the Father. He will protect you. His goodness will invade your life, just like we learned from Susie Larson today. My friend, you are significant. You're significant not because of a number on a scale, because of the condition of your nails or the roots in your hair, but you're significant because of the one who made you. Abba, Father, Daddy. He is head over heels in love with you, and he has promised never to leave you or forsake you. You are significant to God the Father.